Well, good evening, everybody. Y'all doing okay? Good, good. I don't want to take too much of your time. I do want to encourage you with a thought from God's Word, if you wouldn't mind giving me a few moments here to just unpack Romans chapter 12 and verse, and verse 1. Just one, one passage. One passage, um, profound passage, one that we've read and you've studied over the years many times. You've, it's on coffee mugs, it's uh, on t-shirts, and it's a very familiar passage. But the danger with being familiar with the passage of Scripture is you can miss the nuggets. Uh, you can miss the eternal truths. You can miss the application or what God wants to actually say to you or how he wants to get your attention. And so that's what I want to start with, misunderstandings. Misunderstandings are crucial. Uh, misunderstandings, they, they can cause deep heartaches. Misunderstandings can cause wars. They can cause misjudgment. Misunderstandings can change literally the direction of somebody's life. A misunderstanding. It's like the one guy, it reminds me of the guy who went on a cruise. And he went on this cruise and uh, he, you know, he, he bought his ticket and had his ticket and everything was great. And, you know, he was on this cruise. Y'all see him on the cruise. He was excited. And, but he had this weird dynamic going on. I mean, he had this, these bags. And inside these bags, there were lunches. And he had peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Anybody love a good PB&J? He had peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And uh, he would walk by where they were serving food. And he saw the buffet. He saw everything. It was all nice. And he would walk by eating his sandwiches. And one of the workers on the cruise ship said, hey, man, um, let, let me just ask you a question. Why? Why are you eating these bag lunches? And so he looked at him and said, well, I don't have enough money to afford the buffets. And uh, to the, response to the, the, the response to that by the worker, the worker said, hey, I, I want to encourage you with something. When you bought the ticket, it came with it, the food. I, I wonder in the Christian life, I do wonder, I wonder this evening, that we walk around with brown paper bags of religion. We walk around with brown paper bags of performance and works and we understand to some degree the gospel. We, we've been changed, we've been uh, moved by the cross. But yet and still within our own tendencies, all of us, myself included as a pastor, as we, we walk around with these brown, these brown paper bags, so I wonder tonight, I wonder this evening, I wonder what, what's in your bag? What's the bag that you, you still walk around with and when God has made all the provision for you to, to, to experience the power of the resurrection, as Paul would say in Philippians 3, the dunamis, but not only the dunamis power, the azusia power, you have the authority to use the power. He wants the power of the resurrection to channel through your life. But not only the power to live the Christian life, but also that you can have joy in the Christian life. There's many believers around us today, and it looks like they've been baptized in lemon juice. Come on, go with me. They're disgruntled and mad and blah, blah, blah. But Paul is saying, no, 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 drop the bags. Can everybody say drop the bags tonight? And Paul gives us a secret. He gives us the blueprint. Well, why is there such misunderstanding in Christendom today, why, why is there such a misunderstanding? And he, he tells us right here in Romans 12 and 1. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, I appeal to you, therefore, I plea, I urge you, brothers and sisters, the Delphos is the term here, as from the same womb. It's a term of endearment. So he's, he's talking to all of the brothers and sisters, those who've been blood-bought, who put their faith in Jesus, he's saying, look, I appeal to you, therefore, no more misunderstandings, no more misunderstandings, NGU, no, no more. This could be the turning point, the demarcation point that turns the trajectory of your life. No more misunderstandings. Let's drop the bags. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, everything that I've said, the previous 11 chapters. He says, now what, uh, what you ought to be doing is to present your bodies. Everybody say, present. Amen. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. I love that. To God. 
which is your spiritual worship. You know what's interesting about worship, as I coined this morning, we're going to just unpack worship. The object of our worship should be God solely. And I know we're bombarded with a lot of things. We'll talk about this uh, tomorrow evening, but we're bombarded by a lot of stuff. Culture, everybody's talking, everybody wants our attention. Uh, uh, we, we, we find ourselves picking up more bags. But let's run an idolatry test, because here's why. Whatever you idolize or whatever you think about most is what you worship. What fills your mind is what you actually find identity in, find purpose in, find meaning in, and it could be good things. It could be grades. It could be being a great student or a, a great child or it could be getting a great career. It could be whatever. But let's do an idolatry test because until we run this test, we're truly not going to understand um, Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Here it is. We've all been wired to worship. So the question is, since God has, the divine manufacturer has wired all of us to worship, the question is, it's not an issue of worship. The real question and the argument on the table tonight is, so what do you worship? Since we've all been wired to do so. And so here it is. Here's our idolatry test. Think about this. The thing that most worried, or the thing that you worry about most if you lost it, what is it? If this one thing, you, you see it, you, maybe in your, your stomach, in your gut, you sense it. What is this, this one thing? If it was taken from you, what, what would, what would the, maybe, that's an, maybe that's an idol. The thing that would be most, or you would worry about if you never attained it. In other words, if you never arrived, telos, perfect as Paul would use, if you never got your hands on it and this thing you've been striving for, if you never, think about this, if you never get there, will you be disappointed? It could be an idol. If you can change, fill in the blank, one thing about yourself right now, what would it be? Think of it. What has made you most bitter? Over the years, through the years, maybe this year, maybe, maybe you didn't want to come to this school. I don't know. Maybe your parents made you, right? Maybe you're mad because of the cards dealt to you in your life and uh, whatever. What, what has made you most bitter? Could it be that this, this thing has become an idol? What can't you forgive? Forgiveness is deep. Who can't you forgive? What are you willing to lie for? That could be an idol. Oh, for sure. If you're willing to lie for it, it's an idol. Here's one. Where do you turn for comfort? Paul wants to challenge us at the heart of the turning point in the book of Romans. He wants to challenge all of us with the idolatry test and say, look, if you don't really uh, get to a place of coming to the end of yourself, help me, Spirit. Because if you look at the word surrender, in the middle of the word surrender, there's another word encompassed, embedded in the middle of the word surrender. It's end. E-N-D. So and truly enough, for us, if you're going to surrender to the Lord, Hear me say this, students. You and I, we must come to the end of ourselves. That's a hard place to be. But Paul would say, this is what it's about. This is the most important idea from the book of Romans. It's that the gospel is not just the way that we come or begin in Jesus. It is also the way that we, you and I, grow in him. This is the argument here. And so here's the challenge. J.D. Greer, a good friend of mine, said this, for most of us in church, we grew up thinking of the gospel as only Christianity's entry point. Think of this. The prayer you pray to begin the Christian life, the diving board off which we jumped into the pool of Christianity. And thus the gospel was primarily a message for unbelievers then. I pray my prayer. It's a message for unbelievers. On the contrary, and 
And once you have experienced this, we tend to move on to something else, he says. So it's like we graduate to something else, and this is where the drift happens. You and I will never, we will never really drift into worship. That's intentional, but we will drift into works. And Paul is saying, based on everything that I've said, let's not have any misunderstandings. Let's drop the bags. Let's, let's really run after what God has for us. Let's be all that God has called you to be. That's not an army commercial here. Be all you can be. I'm not saying that. But, but let's, let's, I mean, God has called some of you young, young ladies to be leaders, to be spokesmen and spokesladies, to be game changers. Some of the men in here called to be missionaries, pastors, world changers. Think of this. But it's not going to happen until you say, you know what, God? Here's the blank check. I'm going to drop the bags. Because the irony in this passage is this. If we, you and I, if we just look at Christianity as a starting point or the gospel as a starting point, and that's it, and it's not how we grow in Christ, the gospel, you and I, myself included, I've been here in seasons, you'll grow weary. You'll grow weary, frustrated, trying. You'll be exhausted. You'll start to resent or even hate Christianity, the Bible, or even God. This is real truth. And this is why the gospel is intended to get inside of you and I. It's not a mere astute or just a mere message. The gospel is life. The gospel has transformative power. So Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. I appeal to you, therefore. I appeal to you. So, Paul, why are you arguing? What's the big argument? Why are you, why are you barking? You've already talked about gospel, the, the, the theology, orthodoxy, all this good content, 11 chapters. Why are you still barking in the duology, 12 through 16 chapters? Well, here's, here it is, and this is what God wants tonight. Here's, here's the big idea. is giving God what he wants. It's really giving God what he wants. A.W. Tozer in his book, The Pursuit of God, I believe in chapter 3, he said this. Quote, he writes, the Lord waits, the, excuse me, the Lord wants or waits to be wanted. The Lord waits to be wanted. Sadly, he goes on to say, he waits too long. And then even more tragic, and in some cases, he waits in vain. In essence, what, what Tozer is saying and what Paul is saying, you and I, if we don't get past idolatry, if we don't get past ourselves, if we don't get past our own little kingdoms, if we don't get past our own little preferences, if we don't get past ourselves and get to the end of ourselves, we're truly never going to present ourselves fully to the Lord. And this is the semester to happen. This is it. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, I, I parakaleo. I appeal. It's like it's the same word that John would use in reference to the Holy Spirit. I want to come alongside you, and I want to encourage you, saints. I want to encourage you. I want to strongly urge you. Based on all this good stuff that the Lord has done on your behalf, now you ought to present. Everybody say present. He said by these mercies. He said these mercies. These mercies. Well, what are these mercies? Chapter 1 through 3 is man's problem. Sin, our state, we were lost. Do y'all realize that? I think sometimes in Christianity we forget what it's like to be lost. We forget what it, what it was like when we didn't know the Lord. We forget what it's like because we've been in church a long time. We've been around Christianity a long time. We've been around the Bible a long time. But do you remember when you were, when you were outside of Jesus? Chapters 1 through 3 talks about that. And then 4 through 5, God's solution. Salvation, amen, that we're found and we have faith now to believe and, and put our faith and trust in the work of Christ. Be leery of somebody when they say, I found the Lord. No, you didn't find the Lord. The Lord found you. That's chapters 4 through 5. Chapter 6 through 8, God's provision. Sanctification. You can take an old beat up young guy from the inner city of Oakland and you can sanctify him, justify him, redeem him, justify him, sanctify him, fill him with the spirit, and then en route to glorification. 
sanctification, empowerment. He reckons to you and I. Chapters 9 through 11 is God's faithfulness. It's his sovereignty. It's the fact that he chose us. And, and this is where the praise come in on the back end of what we studied this morning. God's mercies. This should motivate you. Isn't it amazing that some things we don't need to be motivated about? I mean, you think about your life. What, what motivates you? What, what excites you? What gets you going? Paul is saying, this is what motivates me. This is what gets me up in the morning. This is what causes me to look at my neighbor and say, I'm going to love you as I love myself. This is what causes me to say, I know I have areas of sin in my life, but I want to, God, you're so holy and so other. I want to give these things over. Why? Because when I do not, there's a bungee cord on my life. In essence, I have a bungee cord. If it's hooked onto my belt strap and it's connected somewhere over there, I have some slack in the moment. But Paul is saying, look, if, if I don't come to the end of myself, it's going to look like and appear, I'm holding these brown paper bags, that I'm making progress, but at some point there's going to be what? Tension. And I wonder in this room if there's some tension. There's some things in your life that God is saying, give it to me. I love you. And it's never, he's never calling you to... To give over things to destroy you is always to rebuild you. It's always to make you into the woman that he wants you to be. It's always to make you into the young man that he wants you to be. It's never to destroy you, saints. And I think we have this bad view out here that God is out to get us. He's some old man upstairs, grumpy. No. What motivates you? Paul says present. Present in the sense of Hey, look, I want to put myself on it willfully. I'm, I, I desire, I want to do this. I, it's cooperation. It's in the continuous tense, which is interesting because, in essence, if you're like me, I like to climb off the altar. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, all that I've talked about in the first previous 11 chapters. Now to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Hold on. Living sacrifice? But I thought sacrifices are dead. They are. In a sense, this is what Paul has been arguing really all through Romans. You remember in chapter 7 when, when um, Paul was so perplexed? It's that strange chapter. The things I don't want to do, I do. And the things I do, I don't. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Chapter 7? And there's made much debate and arguments, and if that's pre-Christ or post-Christ, there's all these theological debates out there. Me, personally, I believe Paul is saying, this is, this is post-Christ. I still wrestle. And then he gets to the back end of 7, and he says this. Profound. I want to read it. And you're hearing, amen. I don't want to make nothing up. You know, I'll look at your Bible. Amen. <laughs> 7.24, think of this. Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? So death in a sense of decaying because of sin. And there's still these tendencies and the brown bags. And he, he tells us, for there's nothing good that dwells within me. But Paul also realizes something else. The imagery there in chapter 7 is in those days what they would do is if you were being punished, they would put a dead body. I know it's pretty graphic. They would put a dead body on the, the back of a, of a criminal. They would loop it and tie, tie it on the arms, and they would have you carry this dead body. So much so that, that the, 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 the body fluids from the dead body will begin to, perme to permeate and penetrate your skin. And so this is the imagery that Paul is saying. He's saying, who will deliver me from this wretched situation? Who can deliver me from this wretched situation? Position that I'm in. And then he goes on to say, well, thank you, thanks be to the Lord. Thanks be to the Lord. And, and because he knows that to be true, Paul says, I'm, I, I want to present. I'm going to present. It's amazing because why wouldn't you and I, why wouldn't we want to present? Sacrifices, again, they're, they're dead. And, but he says living. So daily, even though I like to climb off the altar, I, I got to stay, I got to climb back on. Think about Old Testament sacrifices. Have you ever thought about this in regards to being a living sacrifice? Watch this. Sacrifices always were sacrificed on behalf or for somebody else. Uh-oh. Wake up tonight. Wake up tonight. Sacrifices, a little lamb, a little goat, 
or whatever. It was just, I don't think it was like, I'm going to be slaughtered for other people. I don't think that was the case. I'm going to be butchered for the nations. This Yom Kippur, I'm going to be butchered. And I'm going to sacri- I'm going to be of the blood atonement for the whole year. I don't think it, no. But the biblical implications and the theological implications within being a sacrifice was this, is that sacrifices, they always were being sacrificed on behalf of somebody else. Willingly going. What about Jesus? Jesus willingly went to Golgotha's hill. So much so in Gethsemane, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, you know what, Father, if, there, if there's another way, can we figure this thing out? But, because this thing is, this is horrid, but, but nevertheless, not my will, even Jesus would say this, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He was presenting. But as a result, here's the funny thing. You are beneficiaries of his sacrifice. So the question on the table, this is interesting, why? Because if you're not presenting, students, watch this. If you're not presenting, could you be hindering other people from coming to know the Lord? Don't play church with me tonight. Now I'm in my pastor mode. If you're not presenting, we sang all these songs, y'all were going in on it. Songs were fire. Oh, rah, 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 rah. We were all going in a little while ago. Now you, it's saying we're still in worship just through the preaching of God's word. And so, man, Lord, oh, rah, rah, rah. One, one great, sorry, I know it's real random. Uh, one theologian says this we don't, Christians don't lie lies, we sing lies. In essence, we, we, we sing about. This great God, the great almighty, the great I am, but, but we put him in a little box and we put him in the brown bags, and, but yet we don't, we don't want to present on a regular basis. So I wonder in this room, I wonder, even at this, this campus and this semester, if you presented your body, what would happen? If you would present your body, even in your own home, your family, maybe there's um, people in your life, in your family, mom, dad, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts that don't know the Lord, what would happen if you said, you know what, Lord, here's the demarcation moment of my life. I'm surrendering. You're the holy God, your holy other. As the angels go around you, as we just heard, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. I want to surrender and come to the end of myself. So therefore, I'm going to just bow and I'm presenting my life. What, what's hanging in the balance? Think about Joseph. What was hanging in the balance, sis? Like, what was hanging in the balance had he not presented himself? So I wonder, this evening, God is saying present. And and don't look at the next person. It's It's in an emphatic voice or tense in the sense of, he says, to present your body. Isn't it funny in Christianity, we like to, man, ooh, look at her, man, she did, I don't know why she's doing that. What's that? Right? Homeboys be like, man, we be hating. Anybody, y'all know who haters? Y'all know, you know, we hating on people? Y'all know about haters? Hey, man, come on, come on. But we're always worried about other people, which we should through a gospel lens in a sense of the care of their souls and them knowing Jesus and walking with Jesus and being transformed into the image of Jesus. But Paul here says, Stop worrying about everybody else and present your body. So, I wonder if, what would happen if you and I begin to present ourselves? It's always for the benefit of other people. So, presenting means the totality. It it, it means to offer your body. He says to offer it. it, it's this, it's something uh, to be used for another reason. Presenting my body is going to be used for a greater purpose. And so that means your time, talent. It means your treasure. It means this semester. Think about it. What's the demarcation moment? What, what is, ha- have you had that moment in your life? I'm saying, God, I'm coming to the end of myself. I'm going to share my story. I was in uh, Kansas, um, Florence, Kansas, to be exact. And I began to, Again, I, I, felt, I, I gave my life to Christ in 90. God caused me to ministry in 1996. 
But I didn't surrender to the call until 2000. Some of y'all in this room, you're still struggling with if God is calling you or not. Wrestle with them. That's a good, that's a good wrestle. But for me, again, I was trying to figure life out, and I wound up hearing about this ministry in Florence, Kansas. It was called Morning Star Ranch. Discipleship school for young men connected to a local church in the city. They were already born again, believers. It wasn't connected to the system or nothing like that, like a boy's ranch. It wasn't that, wasn't that. This was like guys that needed to get away from their environment to be able to focus on God, to hear God's voice. It was like Paulie in the Arabian Desert. Just to be able to be saturated by God's mercy and, 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 and just his grace and really to begin to understand Luke 9, 23. Jesus says, if anyone comes after me, I love the Lord because he's an equal opportunity type of God. If anyone comes after me, if anyone, this is, this is it, if anyone comes after me, hear me, he or she, they must deny themselves, come to the end, climb on the altar. Deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me daily. Y'all remember the movie um, Captain Phillips? Is that what it's called? Is it called? Y'all remember that one scene where, where the pirate made his way on the ship? Y'all remember that deal? Remember a little funny-looking pirate? He was a funny-looking dude, wasn't he? Had a little jerry curl. Some of y'all need to know what a jerry curl is. Y'all need to go back and look. Some of the older people, y'all know what a jerry curl Had a little jerry curl. Pirate jumped on, just messed up shirt. He looked at that dude with them beady eyes. He said, I'm the captain now, right? <laughs> right? Y'all remember that scene? I'm the, I, I, I'm the captain now, right? I'm the captain now. That's what the Lord is saying. When you surrender your life, he's the captain now. He's taking over. There's no more you being the Jack Sparrow of your own ship. He, he takes over. And so in Morningstar Ranch, here it is, two-year discipleship deal. I remember being in this room with all these guys from around the country. And I got on my knees and I said, God, I'm so done. In the middle of this room, God, I'm so done. I'm, I'm done. I can't figure this out. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of trying to play around. I'm dropping the bags. I don't know what you have for me, but, Lord, I want to submit to that. I want to surrender to you. I just, because you're worthy and you're holy, I'm climbing on the altar. And people were looking at me like I was crazy. Some of the guys were like, man, <laughs> look at this guy. And, and so, but, but here it is. At that moment, that was a demarcation moment of Marcus Hayes climbing on the altar and saying, God, I, if you gave me a trillion years to try to plan my life, I would ruin it every single time because it would always be centered on me. And therefore, that's idolatry, and that is a secular humanistic understanding. I am at the center of everything. And so this is the case. I want to give my life. I want to give my all. I want to give everything to you. And by the way, it's going to come with some bumps and bruises. So Paul said, climb on the altar. Climb on. It's, this is more than an alabaster box that you threw in the fire at a camp back in the day. This is more than just attending church. This is, I'm talking about presenting your body. This is more than just a moment of emotion or rather emotionalism. This is you surrendering. It's a complete shift really what it comes down to. It's a complete shift in how you see yourself versus how God sees you and what he's called you to be. Paul says, present yourself. Present, present yourself, your body as a living sacrifice. Climb up. And you're going to know when you're climbing off. Because this week is going to be great. Chapels, you'll hear the word, you'll be encouraged. You'll remember some things that will be said this moment all the way through the semester. Maybe it may uh, shape your life. I don't know. I praise God if it does. But, but here it is. It's those moments when you know you're getting ready to lie. Climb on the altar. It's the moments when you may be prone and tempted to cheat on a test. You climb on the altar. It's the moments when you're by yourself and you have your mobile device or your, your laptop and you're prone to look at some things that you know goes contrary to the will and the glory of God. You climb on the altar. It's the moment when you're getting ready to use your mouth in one moment, rah, 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 right? And next, curse your brother. In that moment, you climb on the altar. You see that the gospel, it, it wants to get in and, and get to the core of who you are and changes from the inside out. And this is why Paul is saying, this is your logical, logical, reasonable next step. 
based on what this great God has accomplished for you. You, you ought to live your life as a, just a life of worship. And, and I'm going to tell you something. I mean, the Discovery Channel, I, I, I watch the Discovery Channel every now and then. I say, where are you going with this? Amen. I, I watched the Discovery Channel and I realized that when I was watching this particular episode, the narrator was talking about the possum. The possum, the possum, the possum. And the possum realized something. The possum said, hey, look, well, um, the possums are rather lazy in that they don't want to build their own den. They don't dig. They don't want to do their own work. They just kind of just, they, they, like, to, they, like, to, they like to smooch. It's like the, the, the team that, that's in the house, they don't work and we're always in the refrigerator running up the bills and eating all the food. That's it's kind of like the possum. So the possum is smart enough to go, you know, if, if I see a den and I see footprints going in, but no footprints coming out of the den, that means that what? Whatever went in is what? It's still up in there. And so the narrator was talking. I'm talking to myself in this room. I'm just like, man, I'm, I'm just kind of, just don't answer yourself. I do talk to myself sometimes. I said, man, I'm kind of like the possum. That's not bad for a dumb little animal. See, see, in order to be my savior, if I'm going to present all that I am, you see, Muhammad can't be my savior. You know why? Footprints going in, but no footprints coming out. Confucius, he can't be my savior. Why? Because footprints going in, stay with me. Footprints going in, saints, but no footprints coming out. Buddha can't be my savior. I'm like the possum. I'm like, hey, look, what's in there? I got to make sure there's some footprints coming out too. But Buddha can't be my savior. Why? I'm not presenting to him. Why? Because footprints going in, but none coming out. But I'm here to tell you tonight, this is why Paul shifts gears in the middle of this book. And he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. That's why I had a praise party in the, first, at the last portion of chapter 11. By the mercies of God, what he's accomplished, he lived for you, he died for you, he rose for you. But, but I'm like the possum. Footprints going in, Jesus died. Footprints coming out, he rose. Footprints going in, he was the suffering one. But footprints coming out, he's the sovereign one. Footprints going in, he received death. But footprints coming out, he rebuked death. Footprints going in, he was pierced. You see him. But footprints coming out, he was praised. Footprints going in, he received misery. But footprints coming out, straight up majesty. Footprints going in, he, re he received thorns on his brow. But footprints coming out, thrones. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Footprints going in, he received grief. But footprints coming out, straight up glory. Footprints going in, he was the lamb that takes away the sins of the world, that would die on the cross. But footprints coming out, church, let me tell you something. You ready for this? He's a lion from the tribe of Judah. And this is why the writer is saying, you ought to present. Don't you wait. Don't hold off on him. He's not your homeboy. He's not just one. Jesus don't want to be one amongst many. He wants to be the one and only. So because Jesus has resurrected and what Paul is saying, I'm revving up here. Jesus is magnified. God is glorified. Salvation is qualified. Saints are sanctified. Angels are gratified. Sinners are justified. The devil is horrified. Demons are terrified. Atheists are stupefied. Unbelievers, they're mystified. Death is vilified. And hell is disqualified. Why? Because Jesus rose from the grave. Footprints coming out. Footprints coming out into you. Paul says, you better present. Present. He rose in bodily form for your sin and my sin, your justification and my justification to declare you right, unholy, wretched, so that you can stand boldly before him washed in his blood. This is it, church. This is it, NGU. Could this be the demarcation moment? 
Could this be the, literally, hear me say this, could this be the turning point of the things you never thought would happen? The victories in your life that you never, you never thought, man, I'll never get past this. Maybe it's the wrestle of what, what, God, what are you doing in my life? I don't know. I want to figure it out myself. No, maybe tonight you just need to present. And I want to challenge all of us. One thing, actually two. If you're here tonight and you say, man, I don't know. i am just been presenting myself to my own self. I've never trusted Jesus. I've never surrendered my life. I've never come to the end of myself. I'm still the captain of my own ship, the captain of my own life. Tonight, Jesus is saying this, you know what? You can be captain all you want, but it's going to lead to eternal death. A place separated from God, a place that was created for Lucifer and the angels that followed, and then thus those who will reject the good news of Jesus Christ. It wasn't created for us, really, no. But God gives us a chance in the hyphen moment of our lives. I was born in 1997. I'm in the hyphen moment now. I don't know when I'm going to leave this place. But in the hyphen moment, I'm glad that God gave me enough grace in 1990 to surrender my life. I came walking as a little kid down the aisle. And I'm not saying walking down the aisle signifies or, or legitimifies, if you will, if you're saved. But I'm saying it was, a, it was an outward expression. God, you're so holy, I got to move, I got to do something. I surrendered my life that night to Jesus. He became my Lord and my Savior. Notice I said that in that order for a reason. Because a lot of times I think we love the Savior part, but we, we skirt on the Lord part. I, I love, thank you for saving me. But I still want to be the I want to carry my bags. I still want to do me. Is that you? That evening in Fresno, California, he became my Lord. Has it been perfect? No. He became my Lord and my Savior. Tonight, the Lord is calling somebody home. He said, I rose from the grave to forgive you of your sins, to free you, to give you purpose, to give you meaning to give you new life, to make you new. The Bible says, if any man or woman is in Christ, the old has passed away, and behold, everything becomes new. You are a new creation. No longer, no longer under the penalty of sin. Why? Jesus bore that in his body. No longer have to worry about the sin that just ravished you for so long. Why? Jesus paid it all. He paid the debt. That now in him and through him, you have victory to live for him. The power I talked about earlier, but also joy. So I wonder tonight. You say, Marcus, I, I, I want this. I, I want Jesus. I need him. I want you to do one thing. Just go ahead and bow your heads and close your eyes. This is what we're going to do. We're going to be sweet and simple. We're out of here in a little bit. You say, Lord, here's what I need. If you don't have to walk around right now, please don't do so. It's a very serious moment, internal moment. People making decisions to follow Jesus for the first time in their lives, to surrender their hearts to him, to receive the, the free gift of salvation. You say, Marcus, that's me. You know what? I, I realize hearing this, I, I, I have idol this idolatry and I'm the captain of my own ship. I've never, this is very foreign. I, I don't, I, I need to give my life to Christ. If that's you, here's what I want you to do. Between God and you, I'm just a vessel. Intimately between your creator, who created you, who knows you, who died for you, who rose for you, and by the way, he's coming back for you. Commune with him in this moment and say, Father, I believe that I'm a sinner. A sinner means I missed the mark. I'm flawed through and through. Father, I believe 
that Jesus, your son, was a perfect sacrifice for me. He lived my life and he died my death. He was my substitute. Tonight, in this moment on this campus, Lord, will you save me tonight? I receive the free gift of salvation. I'm presenting myself to this holy and worthy God. Jesus, thank you for saving me today. Tonight, for all of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's what I want you to do. If you pray that prayer, this is serious. This is the turning point. This is, this. be honest, I mean, I know, I know we're in academia, but this is even greater than all of your studies. Making this decision, this is what it's about. You say, Marcus, I prayed that and I meant it. I meant it in my heart. I sensed it. The Spirit was working in me. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to come up here right now on the count of three. One, two, three. Just come on up. Come on, come on. All of us together, come on. I'm here with you. If you prayed that prayer, come on. Don't be ashamed. If you prayed and you meant it, I want you to come forward. Come on. No one prayed that prayer? We're all saved and sanctified. Amen. Come on. Come on. Come on. Don't be ashamed. Oh, well, maybe she wasn't. All right, maybe not. Don't be ashamed. He rose for you. He died for you. But let me say this. Since everybody's saved in the room, I know for a fact that we're all not presenting the way the Lord wants us to present. So I'm going to challenge you in this moment. We'll play for a little bit. I want us just to pray. You come and kneel. Say, Lord, I'm coming to kneel at the altar. I, want, I need to move. I need to do something. I'm, here's a demarcation moment. This could be the moment. We should move, church. I mean, we should move into you. We shouldn't be stuck in our seats. We're saying, God, you're holy. You did all of this. I want to come at least say, man, God, here's, here's my life. I, I, I just want to give it to you. Uh, you know exactly what to do with it. Here it is. Is there one that's going to say, look, I'm going to come and kneel? I'm kneeling now. I'm up here. I'm kneeling. I, I need to keep and stay. I need to stay on the altar. It's in the heiress tense. I need to keep climbing on the altar. What's keeping you back? What idolatry test? What's keeping you? Maybe it's how you look. Maybe it's being popular. Maybe it's athleticism. I don't know, but, but here it is. Is it worth putting over a relationship with God? God is saying tonight at NGU, he wants to use this, this school right here in Tigerville, South Carolina. Could it be that he can flip this whole world upside down? The fact that we want to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, that means set apart, acceptable, that means aligned to his character. So if you just need to pray, you need to cry, confess, but let's just get it out. Let's just do business. God is ready to do business with you. It's not just a moment just to kind of come and we heard a sermon, we're singing songs. This is a holy moment. So those of your seats, if you want to sing your hands and pray there, that's fine. But let's pray. Pray. If you've got to weep, weep. That's fine. He loves you. Give it to him. Let's just, let's chill and let's, let's pray. Let's pray. tonight we're submitting our lives afresh. We're
surrendering. It's what you call us to do. With all we know that you've laid out through Scripture, we want to submit to your Spirit. We want to be sensitive. We want to obey. We want to be obedient children, sons and daughters, and, and surrender our lives. You challenge us to present ourselves as living sacrifices. And so tonight, Lord, that's what we're doing. We're presenting our minds. We're presenting our lives, our hands, our feet, our hearts, our ambitions, our goals, our dreams. We're presenting the totality of who we are. We're presenting our fears, our doubts, our struggles. We're presenting ourselves. Saying, God, would you please work in us and through us? As we studied this morning, our human minds can't logically trace down how you want to work, but it starts right here. We invite you in, Lord, in our hearts, in our lives, to move, to work, to prune, to grow, to adjust, to refine, to realign so that there's no misunderstandings. Thank you for the gospel. That in and through the gospel, we're perfect. We're fully known, but also fully loved. We don't need to perform or pretend anymore because we're loved by our perfect Father. So Lord, tonight, here we are. Will you change us from this day forward? At NGU in 2023, the fall semester, may this be the demarcation moment. I'm saying, I'm done. You're the captain now. In Jesus' name we pray.